Hi, I am Darcy Correa, Miss Wales 2022, and this is my interview with The Pageant Project. Evening everyone, it's Adrian from The Pageant Project. My special guest, as you saw, is Darcy Correa, who is Miss World Wales 2022. Darcy, welcome to the show. Oh, thank you so much. It's good to be here. It's good to finally get a chance to talk to you. Um, now, I normally do my research on my interviewees, look them up on Google and things like that before I have a chat with them. I have to say it's not every day that when I Google someone's name, the results that come up is um, almost died in a car crash. So um, for those, I'm not going to assume that everyone knows the story behind that, but um, we're lucky. I'm happy to have you here, that you're here. But no, um, you. I, I guess you might as well start with that. Is the recovery, how is the recovery? Is it ongoing? Do you want to tell people a little bit about what happened and what the journey was like? Because it looked horrific. Yes. So I was involved in a near fatal car accident back in January, January the 19th and it resulted in um, me breaking my neck, my jaw, my pelvis, and a bone right at the bottom of my back. Um, and I was in hospital for about three weeks. And then even when I got home, I was sort of bed bound for, I would say about three months. Uh, I was wow. in a big chunky neck brace that um, mm. I like to think was preparing me to hold the Miss World cram. <laughs> and, it was a really difficult time, definitely a very difficult time. I think it's actually quite easy to forget uh, how much of a struggle it was now that I'm feeling a lot better and my recovery has gone really, really smoothly. Um, I couldn't have wished for a better recovery really. And luckily I have amazing support systems around me, the Miss World family, the Miss Wales family, my own family, uh, friends, it's been, been a long year but at the end of the year I'll be at Miss World and it'll all be worth it so my recovery has gone really well just waiting for a couple of appointments about my neck and um, just to make sure that everything is healing correctly and my jaw there's metal in my jaw so that will stay in my jaw forever and it's funny actually because I remember when I had the accident and the doctors came in and said oh you'll be in the neck brace for about three months and I just thought oh they're just saying that <laughs> I won't be in the neck brace for three months by the time I go home I'll be able to take it off and then actually getting home and realizing that that was my reality mm. for three months was really difficult and life-changing completely life-changing but I wouldn't change it it happened for a reason and um, I believe that everything happens for a reason and I think that if anything, it's allowed me to have even more empathy with people who are disabled or people who can't carry out daily tasks themselves. So I wouldn't change it for the world. I think it's made me really strong, uh, very headstrong. And in a way, it's helped me to prepare for Miss World because nothing goes to plan and you can't um, shape and mould your life into what exactly what you want it to be so i've taken many life lessons from the accident and i'm just very blessed to still be here and living a normal life and um, i know that things could have been a lot different the outcome could have been very different so very grateful to be here well i mean if you survive that and uh well on your way to recovery then i got to think a pageant it's going to be relatively easy by comparison. Hopefully there's not going to be any broken necks or broken bones at the pageant. I, I saw a clip, I think it might have been on your story, I can't remember, um, where you were in the neck brace. This is back when you were in hospital. Um, you know, you, you looked properly banged up. Um, and you said there that you were a tough cookie um, and that you knew you were going to be all right but you were giving thanks to all the people who had reached out to you with messages of support and things like that. Um, how, how did that feel to have, when you're going through something like that at your age, cause you're so young, early twenties to, to have that outpouring of support when you're laid up in bed, um, that must've felt 
good helped you on your recovery really overwhelming it's making me really emotional now um just to think yeah. about really overwhelming yeah that people took the time to message and people were contacting my mum and everybody was just sending so much love and positivity and i really do think that that was crucial in my recovery mm. and sort of giving me the um the push to get out of hospital and get home and, and really start my recovery journey so i'm eternally grateful for everybody's messages but it was extremely overwhelming at the time i couldn't really believe that all these people were messaging me and and really cared and were taking the time out of their day to to send their love and support mm. so definitely overwhelming and really heartwarming and definitely definitely gave me the strength to to get out of hospital and get home and really start my recovery so i'm really grateful for for everybody's messages was there any one message or a couple of messages that particularly stood out during that time well i would say julia morley and carolina come in to the hospital to see me that was that's actually a story in itself uh, so i woke up one day and i hadn't uh, been able to brush my hair so my hair was sort of in a plait hadn't been washed for about three weeks and um, and the plait was frizzy it was more um more like a raggy plait it, it wasn't very nice <laughs> and um, I just didn't feel my best at all as you can imagine I was in hospital as you say um yeah. bruise and stitches in my face and things and just felt so low and one of the head nurses of um, the ward she came in in the morning and said oh you've got um the lady who um who runs miss wills coming in today and i said no i said you're confused you must be talking about paula the director of miss wales and she said oh no um a mrs morley and i was <laughs> i thought is this my medication talking am i dreaming i really didn't know what to think oh, thank God. So thank God, thank God that she did tell me that nurse because uh, I think the plan was to surprise me. I think my mum and Paula were both planning to surprise me. So I called my mum and I said, is it true that um, Julia Mortley is coming into the hospital? And she said, oh, we weren't going to tell you. I said, well, thank God somebody did because I need my hair to be brushed and neatly put into a bun and I need fresh pyjamas, a nice night tea. So thank you to the nurse that made me aware of that because otherwise I looked a, half a state when they saw me, but I would have looked a true state if I hadn't have known. Um, and that was just surreal having them come into the hospital just to see them in person. I think because I had never met them before and mm. they sort of just, I think sometimes people can become just figures that you see on social media. Yeah. Sometimes you forget yeah. that they're actually real people mm. and they're living and breathing and they're out there doing something at that moment in time. So it was amazing. Yeah, truly so, so emotional that they had taken the time out of their busy schedules to come and see me, which is why I was so shocked. I just thought they're coming to see me. <laughs> and I think at that point I didn't actually realize how bad the accident was. I don't think I realized um, that I had a broken neck and a broken jaw. I didn't mm. really, understand how bad my injuries were so i was thinking oh i've only had a bump why have they come, why are they coming to see me uh, but i was just clinging on to every single word um that julia morley was saying and by the end i think they stayed for about an hour maybe an hour and a half and wow. by the end i was i was getting so tired <laughs> and um i was still just trying to be alert and cling on to every last word and that was just amazing. I'm really excited to actually meet Julia and Carolina yeah. and Steve as well again, just to see them when I'm at full health and can really take it in that I'm actually meeting them and for them to see that I've recovered as well. That'll be a really nice moment. It, it might be a bit surreal for them as well, because I mean, last time they saw you, you were laid out in a hospital bed and now you're, you know, for more appearances back to full health. What, what was it like? I mean, I think it's good they told you she was coming because if I'd been in your position and Julia Morley had walked in, I think I might have had a heart attack. I mean, yes, I was in the hospital, but still, like, 
give, give me some warning when I'm laid up in bed, like, oh, my God. Um, because obviously uh, Julia or Mrs. Morley um, just won a big, a big, didn't win, sorry, that's completely the wrong terminology, but was awarded, I believe, you probably know better than me, I think it was a CBE. I, I saw a photo on, um, which is a huge honour, but so well-deserved because of what Miss World stands for with the philanthropic aspect, humanitarian work that not only you guys do, but she's done herself, which is why she's always so busy. Um, what was it like seeing her and Carolina, who's a current Miss World, if people don't know, what was it like seeing them walk through the door? That must be surreal. Yes, completely, completely surreal. And at the time, as you can imagine, I think it was about three weeks after my accident, I was on really heavy pain medication. Yeah. So everything felt like a dream anyway. I was just, I was numb to everything. I was numb to happiness, <laughs> numb to pain. Um, right. So it was just, even now it feels like it was a dream. I sometimes forget and sometimes I'll go on my Instagram as I've pinned it at the top of my Instagram. Yeah. So sometimes I'll go on my Instagram and, and I see Julia Morley and Carolina and I'm just next to them in a wheelchair and a neck brace. <laughs> and I think, surely that didn't happen. <laughs> yeah, very surreal and just a really special moment. I was trying my best to be present in the moment and feel that it was real and I wasn't dreaming because I know I wasn't dreaming. They did really come, uh, but yeah so special such a an, a moment that i will remember and cherish forever so grateful for them that they came all that way it was just so kind of them to do that can you describe mrs morley just as a person because i've never had the pleasure of meeting her i, I know that i think it was her birthday party when it was held in the uk I would have loved to have gone, but I wasn't. I think that was close to the pandemic, but I, ne I never had the chance to talk to her. So, what is she like in person? So, so lovely. It's funny because the closest way that I can describe Julia Morley, uh, she really reminds me of my Auntie Lynn, <laughs> my auntie from England. So, and myself and my mum said exactly the same thing that she's so much like my Auntie Lynn, but very softly spoken mm. very gentle very calm and just a delight to to be around really really lovely but very soft uh, but you can tell that she doesn't take any mess in no messing around <laughs> soft but stern I, yeah I, I don't think you achieve what she's achieved with the miss world system by being a pushover that's for sure um Definitely and Ka carolina also by the way what was she like? Because I think in our heads, the, the Miss World system has always been about the humanitarian work first um, and, you know, helping those people who are less fortunate. So what was Carolina like? Carolina instantly felt like a friend that I had met many times before. That's the best way to, um, to describe Carolina. Really warm, very kind. Um, very softly spoken gorgeous absolutely drop dead gorgeous immaculate hair immaculate nails i was lucky actually that none of my nails chipped in the accident so i was able to show her my nails <laughs> but just really really lovely and she reassured me uh, about miss world because at that point we thought that miss world would be may. in may so yeah. it wasn't really a lot of time for me to recover so she was really reassuring in the fact that I would be fine at Miss World and it's a huge sisterhood and everybody will look mm. after me and she will be there. So very much like a friend. It didn't feel like it was the first time that I met either of them at all. Okay. Well, it certainly sounds amazing. It, it sounds like a dream. But um, clearly it wasn't because there's photographic evidence to, to prove otherwise. Um, let me ask you, so you've had had this accident. It's a, be life-changing for anyone, let alone someone at such a young age. Um, how do you think it's changed you? I think it's changed me in the sense that I value time with the people that I love a lot more mm. now and um, I value time with family time with friends and it puts life 
into perspective completely. I think time is one of the most precious things and you really realize that we don't have forever on this earth and one day our time is up and we really yeah. don't know when that time is coming like mm -hmm. i was in swansea dropping dresses back to jane's boutique that i had loaned and i had a, a coffee meeting with emma jenkins to go through um some social media planning and mm -hmm. the next thing you know I'm in hospital and my life has been on hold for three months. So it really puts time into perspective. And I think it has changed me into the person that says I am going to rather than I would like to. So for mm -hmm. example, my recent, um, my recent volunteering trip to Ghana, I had been saying that I wanted to do something like that for about four years. And I actually booked my trip to Ghana whilst I was still in my neck brace bed bound because I needed something to look forward to at the end of the tunnel. And mm. I just thought I've been saying that I want to go on a volunteering trip to Africa for the past four years. Why am I saying that I want to do this rather than I am going to do this? Um, I, I, I was wanting to talk to you about your trip to Ghana. You said you just recently returned. Uh, I am going to share my screen because I, I think this is important for people to see because very often people talk a good game, but um, you can see some of the video and you'll, you'll see this as well, Darcy. So do you want to talk us through what this video is, what's going on here? But also I think why Ghana? Because there's a lot of countries in the world that obviously need a lot of help. Was there any particular reason that you decided I'm going to go to Ghana? So in this video, at the beginning, um, it's a video of the primary school that I was teaching at and I'm sort of showing you through the window and there is a river, um, I say river, it's mostly sewage waste um, and oh, okay. litter and rubbish and there's a village that lives on the other side of that river um, and then I turn the camera completely around and you're in the classroom. So I wanted people to see that and sort of realize what people in different countries have when they look out of their window. Uh, they don't have the same as children in the UK have. When children in the UK look out of their school uh, windows, they look onto a beautiful playground with many toys to play with um, and a play area and paintings. Mm. And it was just, so different to what you would see in the uk uh, these mm. are the children oh wow that was the first day that we actually went to visit the school <laughs> uh it's making me emotional i miss them so much yeah. yeah oh such amazing children some of them um have only one parent uh, a lot of them their their fathers uh, have gone to other countries for six months to sort of send money back to the family and fund mm. the family there was um a young girl that i got particularly close with and she didn't have school fees with her the one day and was sort of in trouble because she didn't have enough money to pay for her school fees and right. when i got talking to her she said that her mother had passed away and mm. it was just her father looking after uh, the five children her brother um is in university and he tries to help with her um schooling fees and then another girl um judith she said that her parents had gone to different countries uh, together to send back money to be able to send the children yeah. to school and her older sister who was 21 which is just a year younger than me was looking after five children um Wow. So it just really puts life into perspective. Uh, yeah, I miss it so much. I feel like it became home. <laughs> I was there for three and a half weeks and I just embraced every single second of it. And I'll just carry a piece of Ghana with me forever. Those children. I thought that it was actually going to be really emotional being there because mm. I've watched so many um, TikToks or Instagram videos about people who had gone on volunteer trips. And every time I watched them, I would just cry my eyes out and me and my mum would sit down and, and watch the videos and I would just cry. And so would my mum. But when I got there, 
it was nowhere near as emotional as I thought it would be because these children I met, they don't know any different. So yeah. they are more than happy with the cards that they've been dealt. And it was just a huge realization that, and this is not to dismiss any problems or stresses that people may experience in the Western world, but we're so lucky uh, to live, especially in the UK. Uh, mm. We're so lucky to live in a country that has free healthcare and a free education system. And, you know, children have a childhood and that childhood is mm. really respected. Um, we're just so privileged and we really don't realize it. In terms of why Ghana, I'd always wanted to go to Africa and I saw somebody from my area had gone to Ghana through the same organization that I went through about two years ago. And I watched her video and just cried my eyes out. And I fell in love with Ghana through her video, if that actually makes sense. Uh, yeah. So yeah. I always knew that it would be Ghana because I'd watched that video. And after that video, I knew that I wanted to go to Ghana. And I'm so glad that I did go to Ghana. Some of the girls that I met in Ghana have now gone to Tanzania to do the same thing in Tanzania. And it wow. looks absolutely gorgeous in Tanzania as well. Uh, yeah. But Ghana, I am, I'm so glad I chose Ghana. Absolutely stunning country. The people are amazing people. So happy, full of life, mm. full of joy, so welcoming and yeah i love ghana i'll have a piece of ghana with me forever i'm so glad best i would say that that trip is the best decision i've ever made in my life so i'm really glad that i went on that trip oh that little girl at the end that was the traditional african dancing that we watched uh, i watched a lot of traditional african dancing actually and they're just um some children that i saw walking down the street walking to school the kids at the school again oh i loved it there the thing that really strikes me darcy about this is i i've worked in schools before not as a teacher but as a sports coach so i've i've been in classrooms i mean obviously i was in school at one point as as have you as have you but i've never seen in a western world people be so happy i mean you you speak about you know they they don't know any differently and certainly that's true but what I love, particularly with the young ones in the classroom, they just, they look so happy. I've never been in a classroom where my classmates were, were that happy. I don't remember ever being that happy in a classroom, but they're all just smiles and joyous. And that's something I don't think we have very often in the Western world. I mean, is that like an accurate reading of it? They just look for the most part, they look so not just happy, but joyous. Yes, I would agree, especially with the children in the school. They were all so mm. happy. And I find that in the UK, you could walk into a classroom and you'd probably have maybe 10, 12 of the pupils would be really bubbly and really enthusiastic. But you would always get one or two that were yeah. quieter <laughs> and, and more reserved and, and mm. more timid and more introvert. But even the children that were more introvert or for example, struggled more with their schooling and, and weren't as um, intelligent, yeah. uh, let's say, they were still beaming with joy and just shot, like shined from inside. And yeah, they were just so happy. And um, I would say actually that I noticed a difference. We went on a weekend trip uh, up north to Moli, um, which is a safari park. I would say that the children in the village there, I noticed that the children there at this village was very rural. They sort of live off the land and uh, produce themselves. So um, they're sort of a self-sufficient village and the children do go to school. They go to school within the safari park. So everybody that sort of works in the safari, they live on the safari and their children go to mm. school. But this village was sort of 15 minutes uh, into the safari park away from where the rangers and their families lived right and so very rural sort of in the middle of nowhere and i would say that the children there were not 
as happy and of course it's completely understandable they they didn't have as much as the children i was teaching yeah. in the school um so I, I i definitely noticed it there but i will say they did brighten up uh, when they were told to get in line to wait for donations and there's one photo that i've got and I can just remember this little girl, uh, one of the girls that I was with, one of the volunteers, she put a, a headband on this little girl. She must have only been around two, three. And she had uh, like these colouring books in her hand and something in the other hand. And she sort of just like tottered along. And I tapped <laughs> on the girls and I said, oh, look at that little girl. She's going home to say, man, look what I've got. And yeah, they were a lot happier once they had had some donations. and. It's completely understandable uh, sort of the the circumstances that they live in and still very welcoming although they mm. weren't as happy as the children in the school sure. which i completely understand because they had a lot less than the children that i was yeah. teaching in the school they were still very welcoming and happy to have us there um and we watched a lady she was selling uh, tubs of shea butter and she was um putting the um the shea on the floor and and bashing it and showing us how it was produced and everything that they do they do within the village so that lady makes mm. the shea butter and then she sells it um so that was really really touching actually to see yeah very emotional to um to see that side of ghana because i felt like in the school um the majority of schools were fee paying schools um, right. so i personally felt that i gave the most in um the child care center which is um where children uh, have been sort of abandoned and left uh, by their parents and they're being looked after um by nuns and sisters that live in uh, the child care center i found that i gave more there i felt that that was the area mm -hmm. that i could really provide something for the children and just love and attention uh, a lot of the children there had abandonment issues so mm -hmm. they would just cry and cry until you held them and all they wanted was to be held and they would just lay on you for hours on end and then if you had to get up to go somewhere they would be hysterically crying um so i think from the whole experience i feel that the child care center was where i was able to actually give love and attention to the children i did love the uh, english teaching i really did love that and mm -hmm. those children were uh, slightly older so i was able to sort of get more back with them and build a rapport with them uh, but i would say the child care center is what touched me the most because these children need attention and they will try to get attention in whatever way they can whether yeah. that's by being mischievous and acting a little bit naughty so they can get told off it's all just a form of attention that they crave so to be able to just pick these children up and hold them and hug them with just love and pure intentions and just make them giggle and laugh and smile i would say that was the greatest pleasure of the trip are you planning another trip there in the near future or a similar trip? I will go back to Ghana. Yes, I will go back to Ghana and I'll go back to um, the house that I stayed in and see the people there again. I would like to try Tanzania because the girls that I met, the volunteers are all saying that Tanzania is amazing. So I would love to definitely go back to Ghana, definitely. Uh, but I would like to maybe go to a few more places in Africa. And I know that the organization I went through, um, they do the projects in so many different countries. You can go to Sri Lanka, you can go to India. So mm. it is definitely something that I'll do again. My mum really wants to come next time. So, but I'm not sure she might, um, she might fall in love with the children too much and, and want to bring them home. <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, the organization that you went with, is that an organization that anyone can volunteer with? I'm just thinking about your fellow Miss Wales contestants or anyone in the UK watching. They might look at this and go, wow, that's something that I'd like to do, really go help and have a real impact. The organization, is that something that anyone can volunteer with? Yes, anybody can volunteer. It's called Plan My Gap Year. And I can mm -hmm. imagine that that probably throws um, some older people off. But I would say the the average age was about 22. The mm -hmm. majority of us were 22. But there was a girl who was 29 who said that yep. before we arrived, there was a boy that was 34. So it really is any age. I think from 17 and above, uh, if you're okay. under 18, you have to get your parents' permission. Uh, sure. But they, they were a really good organisation to go through. Plan my gap year. Uh, everything was sort of easy and plain sailing. There was a lot of support there. And mm. you felt really safe when um, you landed in the airport. They collected right. you. And I would honestly advise anybody who is able to uh, go on a volunteer trip, mm. not just to Africa, anywhere in the world uh, where you think that it's needed, please please go because it is the best thing i've ever done with my life and you feel like you you don't feel like you're making a huge change but you're making a change and uh, i met a girl actually there a volunteer who was very inspirational she had been going for many years and she said my um my motto is uh, you can't change the world but you can change someone's world and that mm. will stay with me um it was a really special trip and I look forward to going back. I do. Yeah, I, I think each one of us doing what we can is all that we can ask of ourselves. Um, and probably the reason that you feel like you weren't making a huge change or making a huge difference was because when you go over there, you see just how much change probably that the world needs and you go, wow, I'm doing this little bit, but there's so much more that could be done. Um, I think I've heard of the organization. So I think it might actually be an international one because I think I'm pretty yeah. sure I've heard of that organization over here. Um, and so gap year, you'd be thinking like 18 or 19, but I'm glad to hear that it wasn't just 18 or 19 year olds. Cause I think a lot of people need a gap year from, from college studies or something like that, or maybe yeah. after they finish, finish their university and they have no idea what to do for the rest of their lives, maybe <laughs> um, volunteering on a gap year would be exactly what you need. Was it, what was it like Darcy? coming back to the UK? Strange. It was definitely yeah. strange. I think I had become so accustomed to the lifestyle in Ghana, cold showers, <laughs> a foam, thin, a very thin foam mattress. Mm. Um, I've become so accustomed to the lifestyle there and sort of the lack of resources and um, how small everything was and small buildings and derelict buildings and things that were unfinished and not so much pleasing on the eye. And mm. then coming back to the UK was very strange. I actually met somebody on a train a, a few months ago and we got chatting and he was from India and I said, oh, I love Wales. I do love Wales. And he said, and we were chatting for a really long time. And he said, I think you need to leave your own country to come back to your own country and realize how amazing the UK mm. is. And mm -hmm. it definitely did that for me. Uh, I got yeah. back, landed into Heathrow um, and everything seemed so big. It still does now. Everything seems huge. Even now I'm sat in my living room and it feels so large compared to yeah. the space that they have in Ghana uh, in terms of their living uh, shops and just the infrastructure there. So everything feels huge here. And I will say that Ghana roads did wonders for my PTSD because you cannot have PTSD when you're in Ghana and you're in taxis because the potholes are huge and the roads are terrible. The traffic is insane. Nobody gives way. There's no traffic lights. <laughs> it's just every man for themselves. So I would say 
I'm more comfortable now being in Cardiff <laughs> in the UK after being in Ghana. I, I did see, I, I think it was on a TV show that was, um, it was in Africa and they were showing the state of the roads and uh, actually, no, it's one of my friends who lives in South Africa and she had taken, she told me there was a pothole because we were talking about potholes over here. I think I was complaining and whinging and she showed me a photo of what is a pothole in Africa. And I kid you not, if it had rained, it would have been a swimming pool. Like I, I looked at it me. and it's like, that's not a pothole. Your entire car could fit in there. So when yeah. you say that, I've also heard um, from my Sri Lankan friend, I don't know if this is something to Africa, there are no rules. There's a gap, you go. If you don't go, you're stuck in there forever. So no I don't know if that's the best way to get over PTSD, but I guess it's a way. It's like exposure therapy, but that's supposed to yeah. be gradual. <laughs> I don't think it would have been very gradual in your case. It would have just been like chuck you in the deep end and like, here you go. Yeah, it was definitely. Well, I took my um, neck brace with me to fly in. And when I landed, uh, I got picked up and taken to a, a local hotel to stay in Accra. And then the next day we traveled to Kumasi. So I didn't put my neck brace on in the taxi going to the hotel uh, in the evening. And then in the morning we got onto sort of a minivan and I looked at the boot and I thought, oh, I wonder where the cases are going because there were about 10 of us, maybe even 11 um, volunteers and no boot for the suitcases. So I was sat in a window seat and they started to pile the suitcases on the seats in front of me. Yeah. So that made me really nervous because they piled them so high that I couldn't see the road. Sure. Um, so I put my neck brace on because I just felt really overwhelmed mm. and not being able to see the road is like sort of a trigger for me. I like to be able sure. to see the road and see sure. where we're going. Um, and one of the girls looked at me and I, I can't remember who said it, but one of the girls looked at me and, and said, what's on your neck? <laughs> and then I explained the story and they were like, oh, move over here, make sure you can see. And then from there on, um, everybody was really kind and made sure that I was okay. Right. So okay. after that moment, I think that was just like the little hurdle that I needed to get over. Yeah. And then after that, I was absolutely fine. Uh, there were sometimes maybe... <laughs> On the weekend trips coming home uh, back to Kumasi um, after traveling all day and then if it would get dark in the night for example uh, I would get a little bit nervous driving in sure. the night um, but nowhere near as nervous as I thought I would be. I think after my wow. accident I've had a lot of anxiety I would say um, mm. and worry just worry to fall and slip or, or injure myself and and go backwards in my recovery mm. uh, but I think that having Ghana so close to Miss World um, was actually a blessing that I didn't realise um, before I went uh, such a blessing because now I've overcome so many hurdles that Miss World isn't so daunting anymore I did wonder for a while will I be able to do this and and will I be yeah. fit enough to do that and will I be nervous on the roads in India so I think having uh, the two quite close together has been a blessing for me because I uh, overcame many hurdles in mm. Ghana. So now India is, um, isn't as daunting and more exciting. When you were telling the story of when you put the neck brace on and you got a few strange looks, it, it kind of reminds me of if you're driving and then the person in the passenger seat next to you decides to put like a crash helmet on and you you might take it well like oh, hey, i'm not that bad at driving so just, that's exactly that, that that's what that story reminded me of um but spe speaking of miss world obviously it's i imagine you'd be leaving in approximately a month if not less uh how how is the preparation going um obviously your year leading up to it would not have been anything like you planned, given how what happened at the beginning of this year. Um, but you just got back from Ghana. You've had what sounds like another life changing experience. Um, so, how does the prep? How's the prep going? But how does it feel going into one of the biggest pageants in the world, given that you've had in the space of less than twelve months two life changing experiences? 
exciting. I'm really excited. I remember actually after my accident, I've said all year, I just have a feeling that this year will be the year that I look back on in my life mm -hmm. as the year. Um, one of the most memorable years of my life. I think I've overcome so much and done yeah. so much within a year. And it makes me really proud actually to look back uh, at the position I was in in January and February and March and even going into April. I feel really proud that I'm here now and the time has come and I will just be so proud to be on that stage and to be representing mm. Wales. I think it makes it even more special to me now, having been through, most importantly, the accident and then having been to Ghana as well. It's just more life experience and to be able to say for the rest of my life that I represented Wales on, on a world stage mm. is incredible. And also after meeting uh, some amazing, incredible women in Ghana who are friends for life, some of the volunteers, like-minded women from all over the world. And we all got on like a house on fire. There was not a crossword. We were just best friends by the end of it. I cried my eyes out when I left because <laughs> I'd formed such an incredible bond with those girls. So I'm even more now excited to, to meet the Miss World sisters and mm. to have more friends all over the world and to form really strong connections. I'm such a people person. That is, I would say that's one of the, one of my greatest pleasures in life is connecting with new people, meeting new people, mm. connecting with them, getting to know them, sharing stories between one another, and especially people from different countries and, and different cultural backgrounds and hearing about what Christmas they celebrate or how they celebrate their birthdays and what their national day is like and what their country is like. So just a really special year. Very excited. It it almost looks like there's no no pressure on you. You're not putting any pressure on yourself. You look genuinely, and I, I could understand this if this was the case, given what you've gone through, but you just look you said excited, but I'm not seeing like, oh my God, I have to do this. I have to do, you look excited and maybe even grateful that you finally get the chance to wrap up this year that you said you're going to look back on with getting to represent your country on an international stage. Is that accurate? Like you don't look frazzled at all. <laughs> I think uh, behind closed doors, I do have my moments where I panic, Sure, but I'm not putting any pressure on myself. And as you say, I'm just really genuinely excited and so grateful mm. actually that the dates moved. I'm really grateful. <laughs> and I feel like yeah. the universe and God were working in my favor with that one because I look back now at, at how I was in May and mm. had Miss World been in May, I would have had a completely different experience to what I'm gonna have now in yeah. November and December. So. I'm just so grateful that I'm fit and healthy and able to really give the competition my all and I'm back to Darcy. I think had it have been in May, I wasn't myself. I was sort of sure. Darcy who was in recovery and yeah. I, I wouldn't have enjoyed it as much and been able to give it my all and get the full experience. So. I do panic behind closed doors. I'm all smiles, oh, but I do panic. <laughs> I do panic behind closed doors. Uh, and I do, I do feel some pressure because it's crunch time now. I think for of so course. long, yeah. it had been, oh, well, I'm, I'm doing this and then I'm doing that. And, and then in September, I'm going to Ghana. And now September has been and gone. It's October. <laughs> so Miss World is, is here. It's in my face. So it is daunting and I do feel pressure, but it's in God's hands and I'm just here to enjoy the journey and I don't want to put pressure on myself. I just want to enjoy it and be present in the moment. I think mm. sometimes if you put too much pressure on yourself, um, sometimes it, it, it can be the worst thing 
um, for your mental health and, and for your confidence and you can really crumble. And confidence is another thing. I feel like I'm confident again. I know that yeah. uh, even when I went to the final of Miss Universe GB when um, Jess was crowned recently, I felt such a lack of confidence there. I really didn't feel confident. I remember um, sort of going out into the foyer in um, mm -hmm. the interval to get a drink. And I, I just got my drink and I went and sat back down and everybody else was mingling, which is usually me. I'm that person. I'm always mingling. Oh, I haven't seen you for ages. You look lovely. I love that. I'm very yeah. much a people person and I love to socialize and meet new people and would usually use that as, as you know, um, an opportunity to network and meet new people and catch up with people. But I had just such a, a lack of confidence, I think, from my accident and and not going out for so long and being in a neck brace, my sure. confidence was so low. So now that I think that Ghana actually was like a rehab for me emotionally and um, healed a lot of trauma that I had inside. I think before I, mm. I even went to Ghana, I feel like a different person completely coming back from Ghana. I think that trip, um, I went obviously to, to do a good thing and, and to experience mm -hmm. a different culture and, and see what other people uh, live like. And in that process, actually found myself again, which is the cherry on top of the cake. So I'm going into the Miss World competition, positive and happy to be there. What, what happens if you win? I'm, I'm sure you're given some thought to this. So if at the end of Miss World uh, this year, um, you were crowned Miss World, what next? <laughs> Whatever the Miss World organization has in store for me, I would be, it's actually a very scary thought. I think it's scarier to imagine yourself winning than not winning. <laughs> because <laughs> it's such a, a, a life changing moment and mm. it would be incredible i would be um very emotional and so thankful for the neck brace for allowing my neck to be strong enough to hold the crown again i remember danny Lat uh, latimer said that to me when i was struggling um with wearing the neck brace and paula the miss wales director they said you need to stop thinking of it as a horrible piece of medical equipment that's tied around your mm. neck and and think of it as this is the piece of equipment that is enabling my neck to get strong again so that i can hold the miss world crown right but if i do if i do and fingers crossed fingers crossed um god willing if i do win miss world i will give it everything my heart and soul that will be my life for my reign and it would be such an honor uh just i mean before you head over there um i i've spent a good t deal of time in the uk um so i have some understanding of let's say the differences between england scotland northern ireland ireland and wales um i know you welsh to be very fiercely proud i mean i'd say the same probably about all those countries that I just mentioned. But when you're going over to, because as you mentioned, it, it's a melting pot of people from many, many different countries and cultures. And some people still probably wouldn't know that, for example, the UK is separate countries and England, for example, is not Scotland, is not Ireland. What, if you, if someone asks you to describe Wales, the culture, the people, as separate to the UK as a whole, what in your mind, what makes Wales, Wales? It's funny, actually, because we had this conversation in Ghana uh, as volunteers. I asked the girls to to tell me about their countries and, and we sort of went around. So Wales, I would say, is all about the landscape. There is a variety of landscape. You've got mountains, you've got rivers, you've got lakes, waterfalls, the coastal area and you've got the seaside and also the city. But what makes Wales is the people, Welsh mm. people. And 
it's probably hard to imagine that Welsh people can be so different to English people, but we are just so different. Welsh people, you know, if I had my neck brace on and I went up into the valleys of Wales, nobody would stare at me. They'd go, oh, love, what have you done to your neck? <laughs> How have you managed that? <laughs> so it's just that real warmth and friendliness and very down to earth. The Welsh are very, very down to earth, salt of the earth. Um, people would give you the last penny in their purse. Mm. And it's a, a real sense of community. And I noticed that when I had my accident, but not so much just when I had my accident. Um, there's been many um, car accidents and, and people, young people especially, who've lost their lives in Barry. And you really notice the Welsh community will really stick together. Um, very strong people, the strongest people I know, um, tough and hardworking mm. and patriotic. Very proud to be Welsh, very. Wales is the I... place to be. I, I want to bring up two points because for my time in Wales and I spent a deal of time in Wales specifically, I remember two things, castles. I, I just remember there being castles everywhere. I don't know if that's a Welsh thing or a UK thing. So the, is, is Wales famous for its castles? I think it, I think it is mostly a Welsh thing, actually. Yeah. yeah. But, um, I know that there are a lot of castles in England as well, but I think the Welsh are very proud of their castles. Yeah. Um, Castle Cork is absolutely stunning. That's Cardiff, the one I've Castle, been to. Yep. Cardiff Castle, right in the, the city centre, is yeah. absolutely stunning. Um, I think the, the UK as a whole has got a lot of castles. I wouldn't say that it was just Wales, but with um, Wales, there's a history behind every castle, and that is sort of yeah. enriched into the culture, and everybody's mm. sort of aware of the background of each um, castle, and we get taken there on school trips. So the castles in Wales are something that we um, we are really proud of and we like mm. to show off about our castles. Well, they're very well maintained. I remember yeah. remember going to some of them and they weren't just like falling apart. They you'd had pla you'd have plaques about the history and the families involved, and it was really fascinating because some of the castles in Wales are older than white Australia here. So you have to understand, it's like, wow, this sometimes you'd sit in a pub and it's like this was you know, built in 1600. I was like, wow, that's older than white Australia. Um, but the other thing I need to ask you, so Wales, you said patriotic. I, when I was last in Wales, it was during the Rugby Cup, the World Rugby Cup. Now, you couldn't go anywhere because everyone was out in force um, supporting, you know, supporting Wales, as they should. But here's my question for you. I don't know how much you know about rugby, um, but you're going to go to India. You're going to be meeting women from all around the world. Miss World America, I think, might have just been crowned or is about to be crowned soon. They don't know anything about rugby. To them, football is NFL. Would you be able to describe rugby as in union to an American? Like, how would you describe this game that Wales is crazy about? How do you describe that to someone who has no idea what it is? The actual game or why we're so both focused because I, I i would like to know why you're so crazy about it but i'm australian so i should probably know but how would you describe the actual game i'm not too familiar with rugby it's not my strong <laughs> I'm not point either. i'll be honest when um, we had um Miss Ireland, Miss Northern Ireland, Miss Scotland and Miss England all came to Wales and we actually went to watch a rugby game and I can't remember who it was. One of the girls had no, Daria, I think, Miss Northern Ireland. She had no idea as well as me uh, about anything to do with rugby. Someone was trying to explain rugby to me the other day and I really struggled with it. Football, I find it's quite easy, but rugby. Easier to but understand. Then I, yeah. But then I don't, this is the funny thing. I don't fully understand the game, but whenever Wales are playing and it's a big game, yeah, there you go. I get I get my okay. Welsh shirt on and I'm watching it somewhere <laughs> with all of my friends. So <laughs> even though I have no idea what is going on in the game, as <laughs> soon as everybody cheers, I'm over the moon. 
<laughs> Fair enough. I, I mean, I should I should ask Gabriella Jukes, obviously, because she's I think she's doing the commentary for it, so she would know that game in and out. But you're not you're not the only person. Like in Australia, obviously, we're rugby mad. I don't understand the rule. Sometimes I'm looking at it and I'm going, everyone's just jumping on one another. I don't know where the ball's gone. Oh, there's the ball now. That I've, I don't really know what's going. I think yeah, soccer is a bit easier to understand, but I think. Yeah. I, I don't know. It's cricket. Obviously, cricket is a big, big thing for England, but I don't know if it's a big thing in Wales. But more of, I've a, had a more lot, of an English thing. Yeah. Yeah. I've had a lot yeah. of blank looks trying to explain cricket to Americans. Just there's a bit of a they they can't quite comprehend a, a, a game that can go for five days and end in a draw. It it, it doesn't compute for them. Um, but I wanted to ask just before we move to the end. So obviously Miss World has its Beauty with a Purpose project and each of the contestants um, will have their own pr project. Now yours is called Darcy for Diversity. I'm just looking at over here. Do you want to tell the people watching a little bit more about your project? So Darcy for Diversity. My work with Darcy for Diversity began before I was even Miss Wales. I was um, a black rights activist and campaigning for equal rights for people of mixed ethnicities and black ethnicities in Wales, because Wales is very diverse, but mm -hmm. I don't think that it's celebrated enough how diverse we really are. So before I even won Miss Wales, I went on a march in Cardiff, um, a march against racism, and I ended up on the mic uh, shouting Black Lives Matter, which was, yeah, very, uh, very fun thing to do. Um, nice for me to use my voice shouting. I had no voice Literally. by the end of it. I had no voice by the end. Um, and then also, whilst I was a finalist for Miss Wales, so before I'd even won Miss Wales, actually, uh, I was invited to be on the member of a group of women um, of black and mixed ethnicities who actually went through the criminal justice system in Wales anti-racism delivery plan. So this is a plan that South Wales police had set out um, to eliminate racism within um, how the police deal with individuals and within the police force by 2030. So my role in that with the other women was to go through the anti-racist delivery plan and see where there was room for improvement, um, for example, mm -hmm they had referred to refugees as refugee people um, in part of the text and I pulled them up on that because I just felt that it didn't sound right and I, I just wasn't very comfortable with it with the term refugee people and mm. um, so that's just an example of uh, um, one of the comments that I had for that anti-racism delivery plan so the project as a whole is just really to get Wales celebrating diversity and to advertise that Wales is a diverse area. And when one of the Miss World judges actually, um, well, a representative of Miss World came to judge Miss Wales um, when I mm. handed over to Millie May, Miss Wales 2023, and um, she was an Asian woman and she said i was actually really worried to come to wales because i didn't know how accepting they as a country you would be to other oh, wow. races and people from other countries and then she said i saw your instagram and saw your work with darcy for diversity mm. and it really put me at ease coming to your country so thank you for that and most of all it's a, it's a way to celebrate um the accomplishments of black people in Wales and I've held workshops for younger people and um, brownies and rainbows groups I'm not sure if you've heard of them but bra brownies rainbows and guides so they're um like a guides group rainbows right. is the youngest then brownies then guides right. um I held a workshop with them as well and um, discussing diversity and that was actually in a rural part of Wales but I would say that it's more needed in a rural area um, like the one that I went to because there's less diversity in the rural areas. Um, right. There's more diversity in Cardiff, the capital, and in Swansea. Mm. 
but in sort of the areas in between or areas on the outskirts and more into the country there is a lack of diversity so i feel that those areas are the areas that need the most education on why mm -hmm. we should celebrate that you know lily has brown skin and elliot has white skin and isn't it amazing that we're all different and and we can all live in harmony and and we're all mm. human beings so that was really my goal for uh, Darcy for diversity. I also held a workshop with the Miss Wales finalists, um, Millie May's group of finalists, and that was yep. to get them to sign up to a zero racist Wales and share my experiences as a mixed race woman living in Wales and get them thinking really about um, the diversity in Wales and how we can celebrate and, and encourage people mm. to accept it and to encourage them to stand up to racism should they ever be witness to it. Um, and that was lovely and the girls were really supportive. And I think my goal, I did Miss Wales twice, but I think the second time I had a real goal. I wanted to win Miss Wales and not just as a win for myself, but as a win for mixed race young girls all over Wales, because I feel that growing up in Wales, it's not the most diverse. It's not as diverse as England, I wouldn't say. Right. Um, but there is diversity here. And I didn't really see that in the media growing up. I never, you know, now um, I would say younger mixed race girls have probably look up to Maya Jammer um, in the UK, but in Wales in particular, I never ever had one individual who i could say oh she looks like me and yeah. I'll, I'll be like her when i'm older it was always um caucasian women with blonde hair and blue eyes and i really struggled with that growing up and in school i felt i'm i'm not white enough and struggled with um some racist comments or racist jokes right. as as it was put across uh, and then I got to maybe 18 and then felt that I wasn't black enough. So right. my reason for wanting to win Miss Wales and have that platform was to help others and to really be a role model um, and an example to young mixed race and black and Asian and all women um, mm. in Wales that regardless of your ethnicity or what you look like you can strive for for what you want in life and your ethnicity doesn't have to define you and you don't have to be white or black you can be in the middle like me and still mm. do well and, and make change and find your place in the world yeah it's um i i do sympathize with the the mixed race situation i mean i'm not mixed race but i was born in australia lived my entire life in australia so I identify as australian but obviously i'm not caucasian so kind of knowing am i australian am i chinese am i something else and you don't really know how to ask that because it sounds like a silly question to ask right? like who am i i don't know who i am but it's a struggle when you're a young person and some, sometimes even going into well into adulthood to sort of carve out your own identity because in some ways it's easier if you're Caucasian because that's what you are. It's easy if you're Asian, but if you're somewhere in between, it can actually be quite a difficult thing, I think, for a young person to figure out. Um, and I, I did see, and I think this is a bit sad, like racism is still well and truly alive because I did see a, a post somewhere. I can't remember where, it doesn't matter where, but I think it. they were surprised that um, someone representing Wales in a pageant was basically not white. And, you know, I hope that was just innocent curiosity, but just kind of hope that we can move past that. It's like, as you said, you know, diversity doesn't really matter what the colour of our skin is. If we're Welsh, we're Welsh. If that's how we identify and we're proud of our country, then that should be enough. But, um, yeah, I, I certainly sympathise with that. And uh, sounds like you're doing great work just before we move to the close this could be quite a long quite long for you but is there anyone that you'd like to give a shout out to for supporting you along your journey take as long as you need or as short and sweet as you want 
I would first of all say Emma Jenkins. Emma Jenkins has been a role model to me since the first time I did Miss Wales and has really helped to shape me into the young woman that I have become. And I've sort of watched her growing up in the pageant industry and she has definitely been an example that I have um, followed and I'm so grateful for all of her help when I was having my recovery and she mm. set up a GoFundMe because she knew that I couldn't work. So Emma Jenkins is definitely um, a pageant role model for me and just a role model in general, in, in general sorry. Um, she's lush, I love Emma. And of course, my mum. <laughs> my mum is, oh, make me emotional saying it. <laughs> just an angel sent from heaven. She was my personal nurse and she is so selfless. She's never doing anything for her, always for other people, always running around, busy doing this, busy doing that. And it's never for herself, it's always for other people. And she always messages me to say how proud she is and always tells me how much she loves me. And I always wonder how, um, how I have turned out into, turned into the woman that I am and, and how I ended up becoming Miss Wales and it's all my mum. Every single part of me is my mum. I owe everything to my mother. So Sarah Milne, thanks mum. <laughs> I forgot that you Welsh love the word lush. I, have, I haven't lush. heard that word in a long time. I will say it's not my favorite word. Um, did you hear the story? Um, I, I certainly agree with Emma Jenkins being being your role model, but did you hear the story uh, when Emma broke her best friend's ribs? No. <laughs> I don't know. I, I'll ask her that story. She was on a podcast with myself and Danny and, and uh, Chloe, and um, she was telling the story of how she was, uh, she might have had a little bit, you know, to drink, and um, she was wrestling with her best friend, and this was, I think, right before she was going to Miss Universe or Miss World, one of them. And um, they were wrestling and she got into it and she ended up breaking, I still remember her friend's name, Claudia. She ended up breaking Claudia's rib. Um, <laughs> so just ask her about that story. Um, that I'm, doesn't I'm, surprise I'm, me, actually, because Emma is um, very young at heart, Emma. She's oh, like... Yeah a jokester and she's so funny she comes out with the funniest lines she really does make she me does. laugh so that doesn't surprise me i can imagine her and her friend just being really silly and all of a sudden her friend's got a broken rib and i can imagine emma yeah. to just be absolutely being herself laughing yeah not to take it yeah. seriously she nope. definitely was just laughing <laughs> <laughs> that, that's pretty much the story that I got. But um, yeah, all is well that ends well. Uh, anyway, Darcy, let's get through the final 10 questions. So okay. number one, what is your favourite word? My favourite word, lush. And I know so many people hate it, but I use it so much, lush. And I like, um, honestly, and honestly, <laughs> like on, honestly, I, I interviewed an Australian queen who, and she was working in real estate at the time. And every second sentence she'd throw, she'd begin with honestly or throwing the word honestly. And I said, it's a bit worrying when a real estate has to say honestly. It's honestly. like, if you're saying it all the time, it makes me worry. Um, lush. It's a uniquely Welsh thing. I don't think I've heard lush. anyone outside of Wales. I love it. Used to, feels a bit funny for me. But anyway, number two, what is your least favorite word I don't have one I know a lot of people don't really like the word moist but that doesn't really doesn't bother me um I don't have a, a least favorite word probably like a really nasty swear word would be my least and I won't say okay. what it is <laughs> sure number three in life what gets you excited or what turns you on food Oh, here we go. It's food. not a page and that was, interview if we don't talk about food. Yeah, food. And that was the main thing um, by the end. It was like we were on um, I'm a Celebrity, Get Me Out of Here. Have you watched that? Yes, yes. Yeah, 
by the end of the time in Ghana, it was like we were all I'm a celeb. We would all be laying in the boats. Oh, I can't wait to have an Oreo. Oh, I can't wait to have chips. Oreo. I can't wait. I can't wait for a Chinese. I can't wait for a piece of toast. <laughs> I food. I can imagine. I can imagine. All right, number four. So that's what turns you on is food. Number four is what turns you off. Oh, that's a difficult one. It turns me off. Probably not very nice feet. On a man or a lady. If you don't have very nice feet. Mm, not, not yeah, feet. I don't love feet at, on, on the best day. So to see a not very nice pair in a pair of sandals or something. Yeah, feet. Ugly feet. Yeah, it's the first time I've had that answer to, to that question. Uh, <laughs> moving along, number five, what sound or noise do you love? Sound or noise? Oh, that's quite a difficult one. Sound or noise? I actually quite like the sound of the kettle. Okay. Yeah, kettle that... boiling. It's quite a satisfying noise. Um, or oh, the sound of me chewing, the sound of me chewing. You like things. that sound? Yeah, I know, I know I'm being fed. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, number six, what sound or noise do you hate? To which a lot of people answer chewing, but you've said that's a sound you like. But what sound or noise do you hate? An alarm, any type of alarm, like a fire alarm, a car alarm, quite triggering for me. I, I, it rings in my ears. If the fire alarm goes off in the house or a car alarm, some people's alarms. <laughs> when I was in Ghana, it was so funny. We would wake up in the mornings and everybody would have set their alarms. So I'd hear some one person's alarm, then another person's alarm, then another person's alarm. And I said in the end, everybody must set their alarms one minute within each other because they go off, one goes off and then it stops and then another goes off and then it stops. So alarms. Well, I mean, if it goes off like that, I guess it makes it very hard to ignore. So, you know, you're, you're not going to miss it. So that's something. Uh, n number seven, if you could have any one superpower, what would you pick and why? To be invisible so that I could spy on people or go to th events that I'm not actually invited to and be around people that I shouldn't really be around and listen in and find out some top secrets in the world, being invisible. I always worry about the people who peek pick invisibility because it's always because I want to get up to mischief and get up to no yeah. good as you've, as you've just uh, outlined beautifully. Um, number eight, what job other than your own would you most like to attempt? I think a doctor. I think if I could go back into education, I would become a doctor. I think that is one of the best jobs in the world to be able to save lives and mm. perform life-changing surgeries on people, transplants. Um, yeah, doctor. I envy Millie May at the New Miss Wales sometimes because I could listen to her talk about her um, doctorate's degree all day. I'm fascinated by it. So if I could go back um, and decide at a young age that I was going to be a doctor, I think I yeah. would especially after having my accident and things like that to to know that you can truly save someone's life is pretty cool yeah what about what job would you definitely not like to attempt i don't think there's any job that i wouldn't actually try i think i would try anything that would people would throw at me i would do anything try anything I feel like I'm very much always trying to reinvent myself and try new things mm. and look at new life from a different perspective. So I can hand on heart say there's not a job in the world that I wouldn't try at least once just to see 
how somebody might live if that is their job every day. That sounds about right. Final question. If heaven exists, what would you like to hear God say when you arrive at the pearly gates? You achieved everything I had planned out for you and you have lived your life truly and kindly. That sounds like it'd be a good thing to hear. Yeah. Well, Darcy, that's about it. Thank you so much for your time and for coming on. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a pleasure. And best of luck over in India. When uh, when are you leaving for the international? I believe the dates I have had are the 18th of November. Right. Okay. So just over a month's time, about five weeks. Yeah, about five weeks. So crunch time now. I'm sure you'll smash it. I think after the oh, year that you've been through, I, I don't think anything is going to phase you. And if it does, it won't phase you for long. So um, I'll keep you on the line for just a sec whilst I hang up with the audience. But thanks to everyone for watching. And uh, we will speak to you next time. Bye for now. Hey, thanks so much for watching. Sorority Access is now open. So if you'd like to join an amazing group of women, and learn how to be the most powerful, confident, and impactful queen possible, head to the pageant sorority.com. I'll see you there and see you in the next video.